Hello and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. Uh, Debbie has loved Iris all her life. Her mother and grandmother grew Iris and set the stage for her love of everything Iris. Debbie's a member of Iris Societies in Midland, Odessa, Las Cruces, Santa Fe, Dallas, and Hico. Hico? Uh, she has been Hico. Okay. She has been an AIS garden judge since 1990. She became an AIS master judge in 2003. Uh, Debbie served on the AIS Board of Directors for uh, seven years and was the silent auction chair for six years. She was also the Region 17 RVP for three years, the Assistant RVP for three years, and Newsletter Chair for three years. She's currently the AIS Foundation's Youth Essay Contest Chair. In 2017, the AIS recognized her service to the National AIS by awarding her the Distinguished Service Medal. And in 2020, the Region 17 recognized her service to the region by awarding her the Region 17 Distinguished Service Award. And in December 2020, the AIS board also honored her by making her an AIS Emeritus Judge. She's currently on the AIS Foundation Board as the Ackerman Youth Essay Chair, and she is the president of the Median Iris Society and has been the Median Iris Society Fundraising Chair for 11 years. She's one busy person. Welcome, <laughs> Debbie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I guess I'll share the screen and see if I did it right. <laughs> okay, is everybody seeing a field of pretty irises? Yes. Yes. Right. Okay, good, then we're ready to go. I am extremely honored to be presenting this program to you and for the American Iris Society tonight. My program is going to be on the pint-sized bearded irises known as median iris. I'm going to try to tell you where they came from, what they are, and why you want to grow them, and who they are. There are several different types of medians. So if we're going to get started by talking about where the, the median iris come from. The 32 chromosome tetrapoid bearded irises are all members of a single species called I. pumula. It is the smallest of all bearded irises with blooms held only a few inches above the ground. They may be stemless or nearly stemless. They range in nature, growing in nature, centered on the Ukraine, extending westward to Austria and southeastward through Russia to the Caucasus, Caucasus anyway, the region in Asia Minor. They come in many forms, color forms from blue and purple to yellow and cream and white, and often with a cont contrasting spot on the falls. Crosses between I. pumula and tall bearded irises gave rise to the modern standard dwarfs and thus indirectly to most IBs and miniature dwarf beardeds. The genetic contribution of the species to the dwarf and median irises of today has been enormous. Oh no, all my little, um, <laughs> sorry, looks like my slide decided to scoot over. All my locations have moved over to the right on my photo, sorry. Okay, the original classification of the median irises was not what it is today. When the Median Iris Society first started in 1957, all iris between 10 inches and 28 inches were small flowered beardest bearded iris called intermediates at that time. At that, uh, before this, Ethel Peckman, Thura Hires, and Mary Williamson were amongst the first to go against the trend of bigger, tall bearded irises. And this was in the 20s and 30s. They looked for the smallest TBs rather than the largest. 
Mary Williamson's father was someone you might, the name you might recognize. It was E.B. Williamson. He was a noted iris breeder at the time. And the three ladies kept a close eye on his seedling fields. They were looking for the daintiest, tiniest irises, which the hybridizer himself referred to as runts. In 1947, AIS adopted a new classification of iris based on ancestry. And that was when it became, they all became known as intermediate. It's a very ambiguous classification because ancestry is very hard to um, pick out in the irises depending on their ancestry. And a lot of times they didn't know the ancestry of a bunch of them. But then in the 50s, Alice White tire tirelessly promoted the small iris that she called, called Beardy. And then there was the surge of interest in median irises. Walter Welch organized a group of round robins about that time, and they recruited people from gardening clubs and publications where they discussed dwarf irises by mail. They wrote letters in, like round robins. They eventually created the Dwarf Iris Club in 1950. The AIS in 1954 offered the classification based entirely on height, and that's where the intermediates were first defined. So in 1957, the MIS was formed, the Median Iris Society was formed, and the Miniature Tall Bearded Classification officially was named Miniature Tall. Ben Hager was a charter member of MIS, and in 1958, AIS adopted a horticultural classification system that made the four types of medians, and then they also established the awards for these four classes. So back when they were all intermediates between 10 and 28 inches, there was an iris named Green Spot, that was 10 inches off, tall, and it was an intermediate. There was one named Eleanor Roosevelt that was 21 inches, and it was an intermediate. There was Widget that was 24 inches, and it was an intermediate. And there was Pearl Cup that was 18 inches, and it was an intermediate. So the class was then based only on height. But now, after the AIS adopted the four classifications of medians. Oops, I'm gonna go back one. Green Spot is now an SDB. Eleanor Roosevelt is an intermediate, intermediate bearded. Of course, now that's not the same thing as just the ones that were all 10 to 28 inches. And Widget, it was 24 inches, is a miniature tall bearded. And Pearl Cup is now a border bearded. Debbie? Yes, sir. I, yes, I, I just wanted to announce that if people have questions, they can go ahead and type them up on the chat uh, at the bottom of the screen, or they can raise their hand. There is a feature in Zoom uh, where they are able to raise a hand, and it's at the bottom of the screen. It's either right there or under reactions. If you click on reactions, there's a little hand there, and you can raise your hand. And then we'll see it and um, we'll ask Debbie the question as soon as we can. So sorry about the interruption and please go ahead, Debbie. Oh, no problem. Okay, this is a pretty little iris. This is Green Spot, the 10 inch SDB that was classified as a uh, intermediate. And it, as you can see, it was a cook seedling crossed with the yellow eye primula. And it won quite a few awards in its time, including the Cook Douglas, Douglas after the medal became a thing in 1968. And we have one you'll probably recognize. And most people, a lot of people still grow this one. This is Eleanor Roosevelt. That was an IB at, and remained an IB. And it's a rebloomer also. I don't know if you grow it, but it is a very good little iris. And it won a couple of awards also. 
Then we had, here's a picture of a widget, which was a miniature tall after they fixed the classifications. And I didn't have a picture of the fourth one. There was no way to find one. Okay. <clears throat> there were seven steps that led to the formation of the Median Iris Club in 1955. The first step was, of course, when Robert Schreiner imported the true Ipunula seeds from Austria. And then Paul Cook used this Ipunula crossed with tall beardeds and introduced three of what we now know as SDBs. There were many other people that helped in the other seven steps. That, format, that eventually led to the formation of the Median Iris Club. They were people like Gettys Douglas, Franklin Cook, L.F. Randolph, Alice White, and then again, the people that did the Robins, and then finally, the AIS themselves. And then the Median Iris Society formed in 1957, like I told you, and it became the first official section of AIS in 1960. In 1958, I told you the four classes were defined. There have been very few changes in, in the years since then. There are some height limit changes in the SDBs and IVs over the years. And this year, the bud count for miniature tall beardeds has changed. And I don't know if you've had time to look at your new judge's handbook, but there's only a few median changes that were in there. The special medals that were made for the medians that had already received, that have already received the awards of merit. These are still in effect. These medals are the Cook Douglas Award for standard dwarf beardeds, the Hans and Jacob Sass for intermediate beardeds, the Knowlton Medal for border beardeds, and the Williamson White Medal for miniature tall beardeds. Okay, now we're gonna talk about what are median iris? There are four classes of bearded iris that range in height between eight and 27 and a half inches and generally bloom after the miniature dwarf beardeds and before or with the tall bearded iris. And they were in this little section right here. You look at the size. Now, there's also a thing that we talk about, arrow and arrow bred medians. They are crosses between arrow or arrow bred irises and dwarf or median irises, and they meet the median height requirements. I will talk a little bit more about them uh, later in the program. Okay. What are the median irises? They are a group of bearded irises that are shorter than the tall bearded and taller than the miniature dwarf bearded. They bloom after the miniature dwarfs and mostly before the tall bearded iris. And sometimes they bloom with them. The median iris are smaller and compact compared to the tall bearded iris. <clears throat> they make perfect plants for borders or in the front of your flower beds and make ideal additions in rock gardens. And if you have thin beds that are not really wide and you can't put a tall bearded in there, you can put the median iris, especially some of them. Now, if there are any of you out there that are geneticists or understand genetics, I'm gonna show you a slide that you can kind of look at. This is talking about the impact of the tetraploid ipumula and the introduction of SDB and tall bearded types and the crosses that they make and their genetic makeup. If it were me, I'd have to study it for an hour or two, but thought you might wanna see that. Okay, now I'm going to show you a few examples and give you a little story about these pictures I'm showing you. This is Music, a Standard Dwarf from 1999 by Keith Keppel. That's 12 inches high. This one is Honey Cat, a Gene Morris SDB from 2006. And that's when they were introduced. It's a 14 inch one. And over here, we have Sir Benjamin Dover, Nancy Price, 12-inch SDB from 2005. This one is Web Designer by Nancy Price. It's an SDB that's 16 inches tall, and it's from 2008. 
And here we have Little Swiss Miss by Robert Annard, 2006 SDB, that's 14 inches tall. Okay, and here you can see them lined up along the edge of a flower bed. And here are the tall beards behind them. And the thing I want to tell you about these, these are in my yard. And these were the very first median irises that I grew. And these are only two year clumps. So I don't know if you can see, but how I managed to fall in love with the medians <laughs> happened when I grew this row of median irises. And they did so well. So now we're gonna talk about why you would want to grow medians. First question is, do you like irises? And that's a dumb question. We wouldn't be here if we didn't like irises, right? <laughs> Do you live maybe in an apartment or a townhouse or on a small lot? Do you like to garden but physically can't take care of a large garden? Is it overly windy where you live? And I know because we have 50, 60 mile an hour gusts and spring is the worst time for the wind. Does it rain heavily in the spring? Eh, that doesn't happen in my house. <laughs> Do you like bright colors? Do you like cute little flowers? Those are some reasons, and here's some more. Uh, they are real easy to maintain. They're smaller, so they take less maintenance. They tend to be self-cleaning because the leaves are smaller and they die off naturally and dry up and compost easier. The spent bloom stalks dry fast and don't tend to encourage rot even if you don't cut them off every year at the right time. They tend to look better in the summer heat. They don't need near as much trimming. Not so many leaves fall over brown and dried up. They're easier to dig when it's time to divide them. <clears throat> and they're not as susceptible to diseases like rot and scorch. I'm not sure, but I don't think I've ever had a median rot. And I have had tall bearded rot. So. Another reason is they are very hardy. Virtually all standard dwarfs and IVs have Ipumula in their ancestry. Since Ipumula grows in higher elevations, they are very cold hardy, perhaps to a fault. So they're hard to grow and bloom in climates with mild winters. So people like Southern California and Arizona might find they don't grow well or even at all for them. However, in West Texas, where I live, we not only have mild winters, winters, perhaps four nights of freezing in the winter, and at the most really maybe 29, 30 degrees each winter, because our average low for December and January is only 31. But our summers can have up to 20 days in a row of 100 plus degrees. And I, you can see I didn't have any trouble growing the standard dwarfs. Um, now, the miniature tiles have diploid backgrounds of I uh, Pallida and I Variegata. They have little difficulty surviving cold winters, but the modern tetrapoids don't fare too well in colder temperatures. So if you have real cold winters, you probably should try growing MTBs that are tetraploid. The border beards don't have any trouble at all because they have the same ancestry as tall beardeds. So all the growing conditions of tall beardeds apply to border beardeds. The medians are hardy because they do well in colder areas as well as hot places. They tolerate shade, partial shade. If you have too much shade, if you haven't tried growing tall beardeds and they don't grow too good, try some medians. Because especially if it gets really hot, they don't mind the shade. The smaller rhizome means the soil dries out around them faster so you don't have rot after wet spells as much. They will tolerate, almost prefer being planted a bit deeper than tall beardeds. They are very rapid and prolific to increase as you can see from my clumps of two years. Medians tolerate wide condition, varieties of conditions being much more cold tolerant with standing strong winds and heavy downpours. Pours. They are drought tolerant also. But the best way to find out what will grow in your area is to check with other growers and ask around and also look at where the iris originally hy was hybridized. Maybe some of the ones in Canada might not do too good in Midland, Texas, 
or down where it's not cold in the winter. But that's the way you can determine if you'll if they need cold winters or if they can survive cold temperatures or hot temperatures or not enough cold, which is basically our problem. We can't grow miniature dwarfs because we don't get enough cold. Okay, another reason to grow them because they're easier to show. And I don't know how many of you actually take your irises to a show, but you don't need a van to transport medians. They'll fit into just about any car. And you can take more entries because they take up less space and the containers are smaller and easier to handle. You don't have to groom them quite as much. So there's less to damage when you're grooming. Entries are not as heavy or unwieldy once you get them in their containers and put them in your car. And another reason is because they have a great visual appeal from the palest pale to the vivid intense colors. They have all the color patterns of tall beardeds, like selfs, bicolor and bitones, placatas, luminatas, broken color, rimmed. They have spots and they have everything a tall bearded has. They also come in space agers and they have purple based foliage. They extend the iris bloom season with a regal form and remarkable colors and patterns. They are cute and perky and exciting. So those are the reasons you should grow medians. And now I'm gonna show you a few pictures of these on this page of the different colors and variety of colors and patterns and beards. And then we're gonna talk about who are median irises. Okay. First, we're going to talk about the standard dwarf bearded iris, and that is one of the classes of median irises. The standard dwarf bearded iris is 8 to 16 inches in height. In the 1930s, when Robert Schreiner brought the seeds to the United States from Ipumula, Paul Cook and Geddes Douglas worked with it, and Paul Cook introduced the first of the small iris with branch stalks stalks. The crossing of Ipumula with the tall bearded iris resulted in what's known as the standard dwarf bearded. In the 71 years since the first SDs were introduced, there's been a steady improvement in form and substance. Bennett Jones' creamy white cotton blossom was hailed as an early improvement in form with wide round petals and slight ruffling. But the greatest breakthrough was Paul Black's chubby cheeks in 1985. A prodigious parent for decades, this iris and its descendants set a new standard of form for the entire class of SDBs. But advancements in the SDB breeding over the past 20 or so years have come partly from the use of intermediate intermediate bearded irises and more recently from Iophila and Igenonia and a few diploids. These advances mean that it is now possible to have stalks with two or three branches and eight to ten or more buds. Okay, a few more facts about the standard dwarf bearded. They bloom just after the miniature dwarfs and then they start about three weeks before the tall bearded and I have had standard dwarfs blooming with a tall bearded that I took to shows. So they can bloom all the way into the tall bearded. Oh, sorry, can bloom into the tall bearded season. Okay, they have a combined width and height between 3.4 to 6.8 inches. And I'm gonna show you a little drawing here. You've probably seen this in your handbook, but that means a combined width and height, this is the width from the tip of a fall to the other tip of a, another fall. And then, the, of course, this is the height. So when you combine those, it has to be between 3.4 and 6.8 inches. They usually have three to four buds per stalk. They are cold and heat and drought tolerant. They are short and cute with wonderful colors, high contrast eyes and beards. They have thick, attractive mounds of sword-like green leaves that grow throughout most of the season. 
The standard dwarf beards have an enormous variety of colors and patterns. And that combined with a great vigor and ease of growth make them a wonderful addition to all gardens. And they're usually seen from above. So standards are often op open to reveal beautiful colors down in the center and you can see their style arms. They make those beautiful little compact clumps. So they're good for small spaces. They're very floriferous and multiply quickly. The influence of the STPs extended beyond their own class. Today, most IVs come from crossing STBs with tall beardeds and most miniature dwarf beardeds derive from STBs as well. And I'm gonna show you those two uh, irises that were big improvements in the standard dwarfs. This one was cotton blossom with the little ruffles. It was new in the wide falls. I thought I had a pointer. Yes, I'd have a pointer. No, beige pointer. The wide falls and the little, the pretty little ruffles. And then we had chubby cheeks, which is just chubby cheeks. And I'm sure you probably all know that it's in a lot of different standard dwarfs since 1985. A lot of crossing uses chubby cheeks. Yeah, but now, there's a question in the chat. Um, are they fragrant? Uh, standard dwarfs? Um, maybe not so much. <laughs> I think the miniature talls are fragrant. In the standard dwarfs, some of them are, but I don't think that's a requirement anyway. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, now I'm gonna show you some irises that show you uh, some more about the different, the wonderful colors and patterns. And the name of the iris is on the top of the slide and the hybridizer in the year. So I'm just gonna let you enjoy looking at the flowers and I'll quit jabbering for a bit. You will see that there are quite a few rebloomers in the median irises. And here's an example of seeing from the top. These are, of course, two different irises, and it's two different people taking the pictures, but this is the way they sh uh, you can look at standard dwarfs from the top to see the inside. As we go along here, you'll notice how many different hybridizers there, there are that have been helping with the advancement of standard dwarfs over the years. In all different parts of the country, this one's from Colorado. And then this one's from Virginia, the hybridizers from Virginia. And if you don't see the pattern you like or the cutter you like in here, then <laughs> I'm sure I just missed getting it, so. Here's one from Canada. Here we have the red. <laughs> a lovely green. Oh, here's a better, here's a better one from the top that shows how pretty they are inside. Here's a space ager. Well, there was a polka dot one back there too. <laughs> All right. We're going to move on to the next class 
of our of medians called the intermediate bearded. Now these are by the new standards, not the old ones, but When um, William John Caparney wanted to create a class of iris that were taller than the SDBs, but shorter than the tall beardeds. So he forced some tall beardeds and some oncocyclus iris to flower early in his greenhouse. And then he dabbed their pollen on the standard dwarf beard, beardeds when they bloomed, hoping that he would get another type of iris. And sure enough, that created the intermediate bearded irises. He had catalogs from in 1900 through 1922 that featured a bunch of IBs, including 30 that were in 1903 alone. And another flurry of creation of intermediates occurred in Nebraska in the first half of the 20th century. The Sath brothers crossed dwarf irises from Europe with tall beards. One of their intermediates is the ever popular Eleanor Roosevelt in 1933, and it's a rebloomer. In fact, the sass has bred some of the first reliable reblooming re irises. So we know that crossing SDBs with tall beardeds or tall beardeds with species iris make intermediate, intermediate bearded iris. And they are 16 to 27 and a half inches in height. If you'll notice that's, no, we haven't gotten that far. Okay, they generally bloom after the SDBs and before the tall bearded. There is another line of IBs that has been, has been derived from Iris aphila, And these IBs often have a balanced set of chromosomes and improve fertility. So this made it um, possible to make the advanced generation hybrids and the aphila-derived de hybrids are very often well-branched and can even have an extra basal branch typical of the species. This branching habit is distinct from the straighter, more closely branched stalk typical of IBs from tall bearded and standard dwarf bearded seedlings. My pointer and that's me. Okay, the blooms on these are three and a half to five inches combined width and height just like the little diagram I showed you. They have elegantly branched stalks. There's a minimum of four buds. They usually have a flared fall. And they look real perky with these little flared falls. They are very vigorous. They are disease resistant and they can withstand high winds and sudden freezes and other unexpected weather changes. And they too come in a full range of colors and combinations, the same as the tall beardeds. The IBs have been the color conduit between the small iris and the tall beardeds. For years, hybridizers tried to get pink tall beardeds and standard dwarf beardeds, but they, couldn't get them. And by crossing the pink IBs with the tall bearded and then back with the IBs, they achieved uh, pink SDBs. So if it wasn't for IBs, we probably wouldn't have any pretty pink SDBs. They are really good to grow in smaller areas because they're, they don't, I don't think they multiply nearly as fast as the SDBs which is a, a good thing sometimes, at least I think it is, because they're a little taller. But they're really good for small gardens also. And now I'm going to show a, a few colors of the, the ones, the many colors of the intermediate bearded. And patterns, they come in all the colors and patterns too. And you'll see the ruffles that have been that have shown up from all the <laughs> breeding and improvements. While I'm showing you all these, I want to uh, tell you that I thank the people that took these pictures and most of them are from the uh, Iris Wiki site. 
So you can always see them again if you want to see them. Just write down the name. Here's a space age or broken color. Here's one of the pink ones. Here's one we know won a really big award. <laughs> Here's a rebloomer. Some of those other ones may rebloom also. I probably just didn't put it on there. There's a really big broken color there. And here's one from Texas that was hybridized down in by Dallas by Hooker. Okay, there's a bunch of examples of the wonderful colors of the intermediate bearded. And the next one in our class is going to be the miniature tall. And if you'll notice right in here, these three are basically have the same height range, 16 to 27 and a half, 16, 16, 27 and a half. But they all have different characteristics for their class. Okay, now we are going to talk about Miniature tall bearded iris. Now, wait a minute. First, you could ask, how can an iris be a tall and a miniature at the same time? Well, it's supposed to be, they resemble the tall beardeds, but they are much smaller. So that's why they're called miniature and tall at the same time. The height range that are the same, are confusing, but remember they have different characteristics for each class. And again, you can kind of tell by the, the photo here, the, the drawing here, that they look different. Okay. The tetrapoid, tetrapoid miniature tall beardeds that are derived from crossing borders in Iophila and other species will have more colors and patterns like the ones seen in tall beardeds. They will also have a wider flower and be, that was still must be less than six inches total width and height. Oh no. Hmm. Many tetraploid miniature tall beards tend to grow taller or make flowers that are out of class and might need to be reclassified. So you have to keep an eye on them. It's not as much happening anymore as it used to, but they are, I guess, oops, I can't, I gotta turn that pointer off. Generally, the di diploids bloom with the tall beardeds. The tetraploids may bloom with the late IVs and extend into the tall bearded season. The blooms are no more than six inches combined height and width. And if they grow out of that and grow too tall, they need to be reclassified. They have branch, branched, pencil thin slender stems. And because of their thin flexible stalks, they are the best bearded iris for flower arrangements. Right now, the, I mean, the new standards in our new handbook say the minimum is seven buds and eight to nine are preferred on a terminal and two branches. Now that was six buds and eight to nine preferred on a terminal and two branches. These are the ones that are usually fragrant. Um, there was a woman named Ethel Peckham who called them and came up with the name Miniature Tall Bearded. She was the founding member and an early director for AIS. She compiled and edited, and can you imagine the job this was, the 1929 and 1930 checklists. And if you remember looking at those, 
they are not the same as the later ones. There's no color. Um, it's, <laughs> it's kind of a code written by the color wheel from the color wheel. She was also the author of the first judges training rules. And she was active in getting the first Iris trial garden started in the New York Botanical Garden in 1920. So she helped develop the miniature tall class of Iris and made the first description of the miniature tall bearded. And this is her in this picture right here. The miniature talls are very petite and dainty and awful, often quaint looking. They don't have near as many ruffles, but they're great for arrangements. <clears throat> they start blooming three or four weeks before the tall bearded iris, so you have a longer bloom time if you grow a medians. They really help with your bloom time. They can continue to bloom through the tall bearded bloom. There are many re-blooming median irises and miniature tall beardeds too. That kind of, they bloom and they make you really hungry for the tall beardeds to start blooming. Makes you happy to see irises and can't wait for your tall beardeds. They have less blooms per stalk, but they will have more stalks per clump. So they look like there's a bunch of irises out there even though there aren't as many blossoms. Their clumping habit produces a beautiful little mound of color. And there's one thing about miniature talls, they may produce one round of bloom and then in about 10 days later, they make another. It's not exactly re-blooming, but it's a lot more blooms. Oop, that one, pretzel. Oh, and miniature talls make awesome plants in a mixed perennial border or in narrow beds because they're smaller and daintier and you can um, put shorter perennials around them and they don't get overwhelmed by the miniature tall bearded. Okay, now I'm gonna give you some examples of the beautiful colors of the intermediate bearded. And some of these you'll recognize easily. And some are older, but they're still a miniature tall with a nice form. And here's an example of the slender miniature tall bearded stalks. And there you can see the bud counts on these. One, two, three, four, maybe on that one. And here's a re-blooming Lady Emma. That's pretty, pretty old. I think this one's amazing. It's beautiful. <laughs> here's another good example of the pencil thin stalks of miniature tiles. And here's a beautiful clump. We know this one went on to win some a big award, a big award, and Dykes in 2014. Some of these clumps let you see how many of them are actually look like they're blooming, although there aren't that many blooms for each stalk. So. Here's an amazing clump. <laughs> There's a red miniature tall. Okay, the next class we're going to talk about are the border bearded. The border bearded iris were not a goal for breeding back in the day. They were the sideline of tall bearded breeding. Harold Knowlton worked hard to introduce balance and proportion and proportion in border bearded. He wanted a whole series of these smaller iris. And that is when the border bearded iris class started. 
One thing to watch for are the border bearded that will grow way out of class in height and size. But they resemble the tall bearded in many ways, in color and finish and style, but it's smaller, more delicate, and is should demonstrate good balance because they were originally just small cultivars from tall bearded breeding. But the ideal border bearded isn't just a tall bearded that is shorter. It has all of its dimensions and proportions reduced, including the foliage, the branching, and the flower form. The border beardeds are 16 to 27 and a half inches in height again. They generally bloom with the tall beardeds. Now their blooms can be no more than five inches across and no more than eight and a half combined width and height. Now that's a little bigger than the other ones. They have, a, have to have a minimum of two branches and a minimum of seven buds. They do resemble the tar, tall beardeds, but they're smaller, more delicate and have good balance. They're not just a short and tall bearded. They're good for the front of tall bearded bed, and they tend to stand up better to wind in windy climates. I know that one, <laughs> lots of wind. Okay, Harold, Harold Knowlton worked hard to introduce this proportion in border beardeds. And cricket was an introduction of his with the desirable traits that he wanted. So you've got, but you've got to watch out when you're, if you're a breeder of border beardeds that it's height, range, and size don't get out of class. By 1960, in spite of the tendency of the border irises to grow over large in some gardens, the concentrated efforts of guess who, the Median Iris Society, in promoting plants with proportionate flowers and foliage were showing favorable results. So we didn't let them keep going classified as a border. We tried to stop it from happening. And I'm gonna give you a few examples of the border bearded. with all the different color patterns, just like tall bearded, which we shouldn't be surprised about that, huh? But there are broken colors and space ages and everything you can think of. Rebloomers. Nice red one. Broken colors. Here's a re-bloomer. Another broken color of brads. Another re-bloomer. Here's a Dykes Middle Winter. And this was one of the median irises, a few median irises that have won the Dykes, but this one was in 1961. It's a long time ago. Oh, wait a minute, that can't be. Something's wrong on there. <laughs> Either my intro date or my Dykes date is wrong but it did win the dice. And here's a stalk of the one that, one of the ones that Hooker uh, hybridized. Looks like it may bloom out, but, but it's also a re-bloomer and it grows really well. Like the heat and the wind and it's another space ager. Here's a, an IB field in Salem, Oregon at Shriners. Kind of shows you how big the clumps get. Don't know why that slides down there. Okay, I told you I was going to talk a little bit about arrow bread medians. Um, in 1912, a French hybridizer named Louis Dennis used a dwarf or median bearded iris to produce arrow breads. Among the first irises from such breeding was an iris named Zwenenberg. 
It was a dwarf bearded cultivar derived from Iris Ludicens and one of the parents, as one of the parents, and an arrow ancestry Iris, I, Iris Susiana. It is still widely grown today. But in the 40s and the 50s, two developments renewed the interest in arrow bred mediums. The first was crossing the tall bearded with high premium to get SDBs, of course, as we know. The second was getting a fertile family of arrow breads from tall bearded and arrow breeding. So crossing SDBs with fertile arrow breads is the most common way to create the, create the arrow bread median. Some of the small arrow breads were produced by crossing SDBs or dwarf species directly with pure arrows. But these had no tall bearded ancestry, so they're very, are smaller, more like arrows. Arrow bred dwarfs and medians will usually have less branching than the taller arrow breads. Their foliage, the stalk, and the flower should be in balance and appealing. The same arrow flower characteristics desired in tall arrow breads are expected to be in arrow bred dwarfs and medians. They will usually have less branching than the taller arrow breads. Their floriferousness should not compensate for the usual absence of branching, so they need to be branched. They are, oh, okay. they are eight to two, 28 inches to 27 and a half inches in height. They can bloom anytime from standard dwarf through tall bearded bloom time. Branching and bud count depend on the amount of arrow blood and what the other parent is. So there's not a real standard number that you can put in there. Quarter and most half blood arrow breads can usually be grown like tall beardeds, but if you have three quarters, it's a lot trickier to grow them. They bring in the exotic arrow look on easier to grow plants so that we can all grow them just like arrow breads that are arrow breads that are not arrows. Some may inherit the spot and ray patterns of iris, iris pumula or with or without the signal and veining derived from their arrow ancestry. There are lots of stripes and spots and intense colors in arrow bread medium. Now they're not supposed to be just stubby versions of the tall arrow breads but they should show the appealing proportion and balance, balance that's expected in median irises. The foliage, the stalk, and the flower should be in balance and appealing. Also, the arrow bred dwarf should convey the daintiness and charm that's expected of the small SDBs. Some of them, particularly those with half arrow complement, may show enlarged globular blooms from Oncocylus, Oncocylus ancestry. And that would be out of scale in the SDB and IB classes. But this Onco look is a desirable trait in arrow bred medians. I have to tell you, the arrow bred medians are not part of the Median Iris Society. They are managed by the Arrow Society International. It's just that they fit in the, the uh, height range of the median irises. And I'm going to show you the, the first ones that the Zwenenberg from 1912 was cro a cross between these two irises right here. Kind of neat, huh? So most arrow bred medians carry genes from three distinct types of viruses, arrows, tall bearded, and dwarf bearded, usually iris pumula. That makes them one of the most genetically rich types of viruses that you could grow. They really do have all this. The genetic diversity expresses itself in a wide range of colors and patterns, a wide range in height and guard uses, and adaptability to a range of climates. Now, they don't mind the heat too much. Their dwarf ancestry helps many of them deal with cool, rainy climates better than the taller arrow breads. And conversely, their arrow ancestry helps them do better in mild winter climates, better than SDBs. 
Now I'm going to show you a few of these beautiful things, these arrow bread medians. You can see how they grow, nice, straight foliage. Not, not as many buds usually. And you can notice they all look different from each other and there's, there, that depends on how much arrow they have in them. They don't tend, tend to be quite as ruffled. And then the falls on some turn under just like the arrow breads, some of the arrow breads. We have many hybridizers to thank for the development of the advancement of median irises. Dr. L. Fitz Randolph, Clarence G. White, Margaret Albright, L. F. Randolph, Michael Sutton, Terry Aiken, Marky Smith, Brad Kasperic, Alan Insminger, Dewey Perry Dyer, and way too many more to mention here. If you don't grow median iris, I hope I gave you the desire to try at least one type because that's what got me interested in them in the first place when I planted my first set of standard dwarf iris. And we would love for you to join the Median Iris Society. I don't know if Andy can share this later, but we, I do have an application here for joining the Median Iris Society. And then I have a thought provoking slide for you. Hmm. Marty Schaefer and Jan Sachs from Joe Pye's Weed Garden in Carlisle, Massachusetts are breeding 16 to 18 or median height Siberian. Here's one of them. And here's the other. And they are one of the, this one is 16 inches tall and this one's 18. They fit the height description for median iris, but I guess that's pushing it. But I think it's interesting that you could grow median type Siberians also. They donated some of these for a silent auction for AIS one year. I'd also like you to join the American Iris Society if you're not a member already. And I'd like to thank you for coming. And thank you for AIS for asking me to do this. Whoops, I ended a little soon there. But if you have any questions or uh, just anytime you want to talk to me, there's my phone number and my email address. I'll be glad to talk to any of you. You can tell I talk a lot. So thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Debbie. You're welcome. And Gary, are there any comments or um, uh, there's a, area? a few comments? Uh, I don't think there's any new any questions at the moment. Um, there was a couple clarifications. Uh, the brown lasso, uh, right? <laughs> that was Dykes, <laughs> Brown lasso won the Dykes Medal in 1981. Oh, okay. I knew something was wrong there. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Howie Dash mentioned uh, the current definition for arrowbred medians is 13 to 22 inches, and arrowbred dwarfs are less than 13 inches. So, okay, I knew that was either changing or. <laughs> And I didn't even bother, I didn't think to look it up, so. <laughs> Close to that, but uh, a little different. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the, uh, there's uh, several uh, comments how, you know, people really like the program and um, uh, about uh, how well Lady Emma grows in places and things like that. Oh, but, yeah. I uh, don't have any, uh, any other questions at the moment. Does anyone have a question? Uh, there is a comment from Jerry Snyder who mentions that uh, Eleanor McCown created medium uh, spurious, medium-sized spurious. They're smaller. Really? 
Yes. And oh, cool. uh, I'm going to drop that down. <laughs> yes. Yes. There's a couple of them that, that I used to grow. I don't grow them anymore, but uh, it's true. And um, in that they are surprisingly about half the size of a regular spiria, which is welcomed by many people with small gardens, right. like you mentioned earlier. So Go who, ahead, who Jerry. Was uh, Jerry Snyder. I mean, who was the lady? Oh, Eleanor McCown. Okay, McCown, she she hybridized many, many, many spurious. Spurious, yeah. Yes. I should have heard, I just kind of missed it, but yeah. Yeah, okay. you you recognize her name when you look yeah, at uh -huh. that. Yeah, I do. Because we can grow spurious too. He says Highline Snowflake is one of them. Okay. Tell Jacqueline what a diploid and a tetraploid is. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we'll let you tell her. <laughs> it has. Well, well, Gary, you were gonna go. You want to go ahead and explain it, or it's very simple. Just a, you well, know. The diploids have one set of chromosomes, and uh, tetraploids have a double set. Double right. set chromosomes. Yeah. I saw that one as it popped up. So. <laughs> and so, because of that, tetraploid irises. Uh, produce irises with, with more colors, more features, um, ruffles, uh, other features that normally a diploid doesn't. And uh, in general, in general, let's put it that way. I must have talked really fast. <laughs> no, you did very well. That, that I'm looking good. at the clock down here thinking, oh my gosh. <laughs> perfect, perfect time. Right on time. Right on target, really. Okay. Yeah. And I will go ahead and add um, the Median Iron Society's website to the YouTube uh, posting and so that people can get to join. it if they want okay. to join. Yep. Okay. And so I don't think we have any more questions, um, but the presentation was great. Thank you so much, Debbie. We appreciate it. You're welcome. And yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic. There's so many colors and and oh, such a such a variety of um, you know form and color, and and they're so um, easy to grow if you can grow them. And, right, and uh, if you you should try to grow one of each, and then find out and ask people around you because if it's growing in their yard, it will grow in yours. 